Uh, just like to welcome everyone to the very first uh, Monash Biomedical Imaging webinar hosted on a Google on the sorry the Zoom platform. Uh, I'd like to start. Uh, wish to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on whose lands Monash University is positioned, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. We do ask during the presentation, we just have a few housekeeping things just to make sure questions and everything run smoothly. Could you please use the Q&A tab, which is just down the bottom of the webinar page. Uh, and these will be answered at the end of this speaker's presentation. I'll just uh, ask Jalyn those questions. Uh, the chat session, the chat section has been disabled for everyone. so. If you want to ask a question, you'll have to type it in the Q&A and I'll monitor that as we go along. Uh, it's a genuine pleasure to introduce Dr. Xiaolin Chen, who's our speaker today. Uh, Xiaolin received his PhD at Monash Uni in, 20, in 2007. He then had a postdoctoral stint at the Flory Institute for Neuroscience, and then went overseas to the Netherlands to a commercial entity of Philips Healthcare. And there he instigated a lot of patents, did a lot of commercial work. Uh, he was recruited back in 2014 to his current position at Monash Biomedical Imaging, where he heads the image analysis team. He's authored over 60 peer reviewed papers and has over 10 patents for his work. So he's an expert in commercializing and applying his research. And it's a genuine pleasure to welcome him today to present his talk on machine learning based biomedical image reconstruction. Welcome, Jelly. Thank you, Mike. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our um, MBI seminar on machine learning based biomedical image reconstruction. Um, so, the overview of today's talk, I will first introduce. Um, machine learning for image reconstruction, what is the pro problem, what is the relevance for machine learning for image reconstruction, and then I will update um, on the recent developments in the field. Um, and at the last, I would briefly discuss future applications of DL based image reconstruction for both neural and the cardiac imaging applications. So here's an overview of a biomedical imaging uh, workflow. Uh, we have um, a subject, participants or patients, and uh, we got an imaging system. So the subject is inside the imaging system, and then the um, the measurements is is acquired through the uh, experiments. So in terms of measurements, we have MRI case-based data or PET DSMO data, um, and then the raw measurements will go through image reconstruction and then we generate the image of the subject. So this is an overview of the complete workflow in terms of imaging and the reconstruction. So if we look at um, closely, what are the uh, signals and the systems, how we can model each of these elements. So we have a subject, let's call it PF, which is the ground truth. And we have a forward model, which is G, um, which represents the imaging system, and G is a function of hardware and the software. So the hardware includes <clears throat> MRI coils, PET detector, and software in terms of MRI will be part sequences. And then through the imaging system model by G, we have a measurements, let's call M. Uh, again, that's case basically small data. And then the key part for today's talk will be around reconstruction system, how we can design a optimal reconstruction system that maps measurement to an image. So back to P. Um, in terms of the, um, when, we when we speak about a good reconstruction, we would like P to accurately represent PF. So in terms of um, the, the reconstruction, the P, it can be magnitude images, for example, T1 weighted, T2 weighted, pronoun density weighted, or face images, 
um, susceptibility weighted or both signal diffusion weighted or intermediate path would be tracer activity distribution. So the accuracy, I mentioned before, we would like P to accurately represent PF. The accuracy, normally the first thing we want is minimal noise and minimal artifacts, for example, motion and um, image homogeneity. So we want to have a good uniform image and the quantitative accuracy. Um, so <clears throat> you may wonder why we need to use machine learning. Can we just model G and calculate the inverse of that? Um, it actually comes from a, a term called uncertainty. Um, so the uncertainty comes from uh, multiple factors. Um, so the uncertainty in other word is called imperfection. Um, let's call it dirty G. It can be introduced due to the limited imaging hardware, for, for example, grinding delays, if you're in homogeneity, which is something, um, the engineering limitation, and also limited the fundamental physics principles. Um, and also another popular limitation could be we want to make the scan faster, we undersample the data. Um, and then subject movements during examination often occur. So all these factors will cause M to lose information some sort from the ground truth PF. And consequently, G becomes ill post problem. So um, the inverse of ill post problem is much more difficult. That's where machine learning and especially deep learning can help a lot in this context. So if we look at the um, um, MRI imagery interaction methods development over the years, so initially we have um, a Fourier transform reconstruction in the early days of MRI. Um, the Fourier transform is applied to the measurements and then we reconstruct an image. And during 1990s, the parallel imaging technique um, becomes popular. Um, so the parallel imaging techniques is addressing the um, undersampling issue. And then we calculate the inverse in a um, optimization problem, P minus HS. So P is your measurement, that is the ground truth, and H is your inverse system, S is your measurements again. And then you, you can calculate a, in a more optimization way. And then in early 2000, the regularization becomes popular. So on top of parallel imaging, we apply a regularized term here. If we know any prior information on the measurements, uh, uh, one popular technique is use total variation to regularize, to reduce the noise substantially from the recondrag image. And then around 2010 and onwards, computer sensing becomes um, an important topic to accelerate uh, MRI. So comfort sensing is to you is a technique that use a specific assumption with the image, um, and then we can drag the image, assuming the image are sparsely represented, and then we can leverage that as a prior strong prior to reconstruct image. Um, in 2015 and onwards, deep deep models all start becoming. Um, a useful technique for reconstructing images. So uh, all the previous techniques are shallow networks, are shallow models. We, the H are simple. Um, it can be linear, nonlinear, but uh, only with a um, few parameters. But once it comes to deeper models, H um, are neural networks um, that contains millions of parameters. The parameterization, optimization becoming a large problem. So, that's the development, and this talk will be around mainly around deep models. We'll look at deep learning recent development in this field and up to around um, that topic and uh, some of our development in this field as well. Um, so this is the um, um, regularized deep learning. So the initial attempt, um, Young et al. in 2017 developed a technique and published in HVTMI. So they incorporate the deep learning network within the comfort sensing reconstruction. So it becomes comfort sensing plus the DL regularization. And the particular network they use was a generative aggressive um, adversary network. 
um, sorry, it's called um, uh, <clears throat> GAN, and then that's, that's is embedded into CS MRI, it's compressed sensing MRI, um, to further improve the image quality and the speed of the data acquisition. So they have designed a special loss function for their network. So uh, a total loss function equals uh, image space loss function, mean square error, pixel wise loss function as shown here, and then a frequency loss function as well. Um, and also a perceptual loss, look at the image similarity between the reconstructed and the ground truth image, and of course a generative loss uh, within the GAN network. Well, so that's the early attempt to combine different inside a compress sensing reconstruction. So in 2018, Drew et al. Um, made a more ambitious approach to use deep learning for image reconstruction. So they basically map the measurements completely from the measurement space to image, end to end. Okay, so um, during that process, the K space, for example, if it's MRI, um, map directly to the image. Then they introduce a fully connect, connected layer to model the Fourier transform and then map the complex sensor data, which is case space, into the image. So um, this is the, um, the work and the model they, they use and they have tested in different um, uh, case space trajectories, uh, radio, uh, spiral, and also heavily undersampled case with data or with some artifacts as well. For example, here is with gradient uh, imperfection delays and so on. So they compared their technique, it's called the automat um, in this row, as you can see, and then with the conventional technique, state of the art prior deep learning. So they have demonstrated that automat reconstructs better in terms of a mean square error compared with conventional technique. So in different trajectories, uh, also in uh, heavily undersampled data. Yeah, okay. So we also take um, adventure in this in around 2017, um, Kamlesh developed this end-to-end um, -end approach for motion corrected um, deep learning uh, reconstruction for MRI. So with the input, I'm not going into details. If you're interested, have a look at Kamlesh's paper published in both ASMR and in the AMR in Bellman. Um, so basically it's a 2D network. We have an input and we have an output. The network architecture is a ResNet um, encoder decoder architecture. Uh, so with um, inception network, we look at the multi-resolution aspects because motion um, can be a global artifact or a local artifact depending on the perception, uh, depending on the severity of the, the motion artifacts. So this network really captures the severity and the spread of the motion really well. So we use this and demonstrates uh, improve the motion correction. As you can see here, we tested two scenarios. So the first scenario is with the slowly moving um, head movements. And then, then we also look at uh, abrupt motion, so sudden changes in the, um, um, in the head position um, for um, neural uh, examination. So we look at a slowly moving motion in both scenarios. Um, the motion artifacts, if you compare the ground truth, which is the first one, and then with motion, you see this uh, Gibbs ring artifacts in, in the slow motion and the more sudden change of the image um, in um, sudden motion. And then we compare it with uh, image-based technique for to correct motion called entropy-based technique. And um, the, our technique we call MocoNet. Uh, MocoNet really improves the reduce the motion artifacts, suppressing the motion artifacts um, effectively uh, compared with the ground truth and the motion um, corrupted the image. So, and then we, we also further extend the, the network to include different loss function uh, to evaluate the image reconstruction accuracy. So most of the people 
in the literature use um, a sort of a regression loss function where we look at the neighborhood effects. We look at the loss function by summing up all the voxels in the image. Um, the problem with that is you don't differentiate between uh, image sharpness and the effectiveness of reducing noise, right? A sharper image and a blurred image may give you an equal uh, loss function in terms of um, in terms of um, a regression type of approach. When you look at the cross entropy, where the technique Kamlash introduced later, um, we look at per pixel. So we're basically using a classification network for image reconstruction. So the challenge here is the classification network per pixel will requires a lot of memory. So we have done a lot of parallelization and the wave um, look at images in block um, and also um, parallelize in terms of the, the, the depth, in terms of the, the um, for example, MRI, we normally have 16 bits of uh, storage, uh, and then we can look at the per eight bits as a segment, and then that can be parallelized to, to speed up the reconstruction. And the image quality by using that approach is substantially improved compared with conventional um, deep learning networks a regression-based deep learning network, as you can see from here, DLC is classification network Kamlash introduced, who we used, um, and in this case, testing in brain imaging. And compared with the reference and the zero billing reconstruction, which is the um, very early on technique, and the comfort sensing, which shows uh, blocky uh, effects, um, artifacts, and deep learning network, deep learning, um, different loss function, whether it's L2 or L1, they both regression based loss and compare those with the classification loss, we see uh, a better image quality overall and in both uh, reducing noise and image sharpness. So I will move on to a um, slightly different topic, but uh, also using um, machine learning for image reconstruction. In this particular case, we look at MR PET image reconstruction. So MRPAD is, um, uh, is, is a scanner we installed at the Monash Biomedical Imaging in 2016. Um, and the strength of this scanner is acquired dual modality simultaneously. So we have an MRI um, and we have a pad. Um, so the, uh, this, although the, the data is acquired simultaneously, um, the image reconstruction then separately inside the scanner. So, uh, we think we can do better in terms of merging and fusion the two modalities together. So this is a technique developed by uh, Viswana. Um, so he developed a dictionary-based MR pet reconstruction technique where we can extract patches the corresponding MRI and pet um, into a dictionary form. So as you can see, we put into a matrix where we have a different patch locations um, so sort of a tensor setup, and then we can calculate a basis function. Um, and with a non-negativity um, constraint, so all the, um, all the price are positive. So, and, and um, we can see MRI basis and the corresponding pad basis. And the reconstruction will take the following form. We have MRI reconstruction plus a pad reconstruction simultaneously regularized for both based on dictionary. So the dictionary as a function of the MRI and the PET. And here is the result. The impact of this uh, dictionary uh, based reconstruction can be clearly seen in PET in terms of uh, reducing the uh, noise amplification because the MRI is much higher um, spatial resolution and the signal noise. Um, but if we accelerate MRI, uh, we have artifacts, right? We, we know the uh, aliasing artifacts and the parallel image artifacts will occur if we speed up MRI acquisition. So if we do a conventional uh, image reconstruction without the dictionary, it shows a noise breakthrough, especially in the center where the, uh, the condition number of your inverse system, we're talking about before, H is very poor, the noise will be amplify significantly in those locations. Where we use the um, joint dictionary, this can be substantially improved. And the information is actually coming from PET. 
Um, so in a way, MRI is a helping PET reconstruction, but also PET is a helping MRI reconstruction during this process, the simultaneous reconstruction process. So now these are the uh, recent update um, around machine learning for um, biomedical image reconstruction. I want to briefly um, discuss the future directions of using um, MRI, um, as you're using deep learning for MRI reconstruction. So this is a work from um, Anton, um, recently published in PS, and they demonstrate there's some um, instability issue with um, deep models compared with conventional models. So they have done an interesting experiment where they perturb, so adding a small perturbation in the, um, in the input image, um, so as you can see here in top row, where the, these are the input images. So original image is called original X, and then with different level of R's included. So R means a small perturbation. Uh, you can't really visually see any differences in the images because they are very small. But once you feed into the reconstruction network, so the original X seems reconstructing really well. And with the conventional technique, the last column it reconstructs really well, but um, with deep learning, it may become unstable. You see the artifacts showing up in the, in the image. So this is one of the area in the community we want to address. It's a stability issue. The other way, out of sample performance need to be addressed. Another interesting direction for neural imaging in particular uh, is ultra fast imaging and the synthetic imaging. Okay, this is the interesting work published uh, in ICCV in 2018, where they have, um, they use T2 to reconstruct T1, to synthesize T1 image uh, without any acquisition of T1 contrast at all. So they demonstrate the reconstruction um, similar to T1 as you compare with the ground truth. Um, this type of work uh, still needs a lot of uh, quantitative uh, validation, um, but it's, um, it's a good starting point. It's a very interesting starting point um, that will help with the further uh, speed up MR acquisition and reconstruction. So um, we also made some effort in this space. So we, we try to um, improve the PET reconstruction, for example, in this case, we have the simultaneous MRI and the PET. The PET is a 30 seconds binning, so it's, which means the signal noise is very, very low. Uh, you know, conventional PET is 20 to 40 minutes, right? In this case, we only do 30 seconds. So as you can see, the, the image is really uh, low resolution, um, high noise, um, but with the MRI, we can improve the image quality substantially. So joint reconstruction based on machine learning, deep learning can improve the uh, PET image quality in particular here substantially, even with the 30 second reconstruction. You can see from this, uh, um, this middle column, the third column here, which is a joint reconstruction. And if you compare with the conventional smoothing with um, very high kernel, the, uh, the image quality still improves uh, compared with um, in, in terms of the accuracy, uh, spatial lo localization of structures is much more um, better defined with this joint reconstruction technique. Um, so another area for neural imaging is the um, active learning or self-supervision. It's very interesting. So um, Bailey in 2019 published this work in uh, Neurix. So basically they, they try to map a natural image scene with fMRI recordings. Um, conventionally, people do a um, supervised, a completely supervised way, which means you have a pair of uh, natural stimulation, stimuli, and then the fMRI recording, and then you map the relationship between the two. However, the limitation is we don't have such recording and it's not very um, generalizable. Um, so they developed this two stages approach. Uh, we do first the um, supervised way, and then we do uh, unsupervised learning. So natural image to natural image, uh, fMRI to fMRI. So it, the importance of this 
is that we, we don't need training anymore. So let's say you have an fMRI experiment following their imaging paradigm, you can potentially uh, recognize the, the images, reconstruct the images. So they compare their approach on two data sets um, and uh, demonstrates um, the um, ac more accuracy compared with the conventional um, literature technique. So the last area I want to highlight is the potential for deep learning in cardiac imaging. So cardiac imaging, deep learning, uh, sort of natural fit. Um, and so net, the cardiac imaging requires, uh, especially for real-time imaging, uh, it requires much faster data acquisition, um, where the conventional technique will having problems we can drag, as you can see, the image quality uh, is a lot poor compared to the gated image uh, shown in panel A. And if you use um, deep learning approach, uh, a convolutional neural net, you, you can reconstruct an image um, at nine times faster, but image quality is very similar to the gated image. So there's uh, definitely a great potential in this area. Um, so that's all for my presentation. And I would like to acknowledge um, our um, Kamlesh and Vismana for their work and uh, uh, our collaborators from um, Siemens and ULIC and our internal collaborators within Monash and Monash Health and uh, Alfred and our funding agencies. Um, and also if you have a question, you can contact me. Uh, my contact details are here as well. Okay, so that's all my presentation. Thank you for a great presentation, Jerry. Um we have one question on the Q&A panel. Hopefully people are busy typing others, but uh, I'll just ask you the question from Stefan Bollman. He said, thank you for a great talk. Regarding synthesis of contrasts, uh, I often struggle to see the validity of synthesizing contrasts. For example, T1 from T2, the information is simply not in the measured data. Uh, and he's asking you what you think the benefit of this could be. Um, that's a very good question, um, Stefan. I think you point, uh, you know, correctly, if the information is not captured, what are the value of doing that, whether it's truly possible. I think the first step could be we um, reduce the acquisition of the T1, for example, in the, their case, um, we do a, you know, a very fast T1 acquisition with really minimum amount of data acquired and the leverage the contrast from T2 to reconstruct the T1. So this is the area still needs a lot of validation and uh, continuous uh, experimental work. Thanks, Shirley. Uh, I have another question from Matt Timmy. Can you talk more about the perturbation effect? What was the perturbation and how does it affect stability? Uh, right, so the perturbation experiment, um, what they have done was the, um, the, the try to search, um, let's say the, the network parameter has been identified. So after that, they try to search whether there exists a small perturbation can change the input and output um, difference. So which means a small change in the input will cause a large effect in the in the output. So they actually design optimization problem in such a way um, to, to test the stability of the network. Thanks, Shirley. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, particularly if you've asked a question, just type them in the Q&A and I can read them out as well. Uh, I guess- so, I Mike, a... I, I have a question. I yep. can't seem to type in being a panelist, so I'll just <laughs> ask it verbally. Um, <laughs> Uh, thanks a lot, Jialin. I think that was a great overview, really beautiful work. Um, and it's amazing to see how quickly, I guess, the quality of this imaging um, is improving with, with, um, with deep learning and machine learning approaches. Um, I guess my question to you, I've got two questions really. One is um, around this out of, um, out of sample performance and the stability or instabilities associated with that. 
like that can really create um, major problems for the application of um, deep learning reconstructions. And I just wondered if you could reflect a little bit more on whether you think that is ultimately going to be sort of addressable, or do you think that um, there's going to be some major pitfalls with having instabilities because of out of sample, um, you know, out of the training samples? And the second part of the question is around just how big the data sets need to be to do good training, or at least in those applications you showed that involve having training data sets. Um, are we talking sort of hundreds or thousands or how many data sets do we need to get really robust deep learning reconstruction models? That's a very good question, Gary. I think you are pushing the boundary of the, uh, the, um, the deep learning um, research here. So I guess to answer the first question, the whether stability will be uh, a fundamental issue for deep learning or not. I think the uh, community um, beyond imaging, I mean, the, the deep learning community is trying to address two issues fundamentally. One is, um, can we make it generalizable? And can we make a deep learning rather than black box to make it um, explainable? I think along those lines, um, a lot of the model parameters we get a clearer and clearer understanding. So that's one aspect we can certainly, will certainly help the out of sample performance problem. Another aspect of this, so, and also our work in terms of uh, Kamlesh previous work, we try to use physical knowledge to augment the deep learning models where we can generate, maybe this is also linked to the second question, Gary. So we can generate a lot of new data, uh, which will enrich the model information using the physical knowledge. Um, so we can, for example, the motion, we can, we can simulate the motion artifacts. I think people um, also develop different techniques for, for example, QSM, you can simulate, um, um, that's probably Stephen's work as well in the um, in in the um, to simulate uh, QSM samples to train a deep learning model uh, in in that way. So that I think a acquired data plus the um, simulated data can create a unique opportunity for solving a lot of these issues. But what is correct is the deep learning has millions of parameters compared to conventional physics based modeling, which has only 10, 20 parameters. So we can think about millions of parameters against 20 parameters, million parameters, you <laughs> need a you know, substantially larger amount of data to train, yeah, uh, exponentially larger. Right, thanks. Matthew has a, another question. Is the, similar to the one I was going to ask, is the end-to-end -end deep learning reconstruction actually justifiable in terms of processing time? Mm -hmm. That's another good question, uh, Matthew. So the, um, the automat work and also our end-to-end -end image reconstruction work, the training from end-to-end -end definitely a lot um, time consuming, especially the automat work. They, they have a fully connected layer to map the Fourier transform. So that's also one of the limitations of their work. They can only apply to small data sets. You can't reconstruct a large uh, images. Uh, but once you train the model, let's say you take a few hours uh, a day, you train the model once a million parameters um, been estimated, the um, inference of that model is actually in few seconds. It's not that bad at all. Okay, thank you, John. Um, I just have, uh, there's no more questions in the q and if anyone wants to quickly type one in. Uh, I was interested in the dictionary-based PEDMR reconstruction. I assume that would be tracer-specific. Is there any chance to train those to be, you know, usable across multiple tracers to guide the MR reconstruction? Yeah, that's a very good um, point. So it will be tracer dependent. The um, mutual information between different pad tracers, um, I would say is the instrumentation aspect. So the detector modeling, the, um, the bio distribution of the tracer will be different. So there is opportunity 
to model the physics, underlying physics instrumentation aspect as a using dictionary. But on top of that, it need to be a tracer dependent model to adapt the um, for each tracer. And I think that's how it should be done. All right. Just had one last comment, um, Xiaolin, whether or not you had thought about looking at um, total body pet mm. image data, uh, which can, of course, with the incredible sensitivity of those total body scanners, um, can provide um, data with uh, very, very short uh, or sufficient um, counts and data in a very short time interval. Have you considered that for deep learning applications? And if so, how fast do you think you can get a whole body total body pet image um, acquired, yeah. constructed. Yeah, we haven't, um, I haven't really think about that, but that's a good point. I guess if we can reduce the pet um, dose to a minimum level, let's say the speed, then the, the bad shuffling speed, it will be the limitation. Then. <laughs> Great, thanks. So I guess Matt's asking another very summative question, which is good. Uh, we'll leave it on this one, I think. Are you saying that you can see the end of conventional iterative reconstruction techniques? Um, yes and no. I would say the role of the conventional iterative reconstruction techniques uh, definitely will play a role in the whole reconstruction in some form. So deep learning initially in 2017, 2015, were used to regularize conventional iterative reconstruction. Now the role is switched. Conventional iterative reconstruction technique now is used to regularize deep learning techniques. So especially for the um, out of sample performance, I think the conventional iterative reconstruction will play an important guidance for deep learning. Um, but once the deep models will further improve the conventional iterative reconstruction uh, the effect can be absorbed into deep models. That's, that's how I see it moves forward. Okay. Thank you to everyone that uh, asked questions and attended. I'd especially like to thank Zhao Lin for a wonderful talk. I think uh, I certainly got a lot out of it. Um, and just to mention that the next MBI seminar will be on the 13th of August by Professor Antonio Verdejo Garcia, who's at Monash University, and that will be on his addiction research. So hopefully we can see you all back for that one. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>